months and years ahead. Well, as we uh, continue in our study of the Gospel of John, we, we began uh, studying the Gospel of John in January. Um, we started at the first of the year uh, with John 1.1. 1, 1. And we are five weeks in, we're still in chapter one. So that's just how it is. Uh, we're, we're taking our time with it. We're going to work through this gospel and we're going to get all we can out of this gospel. We're going to, there is so much truth and power uh, and life enriching stuff in this gospel that we're just going to soak it all in. You, you guys okay with that? So here we are. Uh, in chapter 1, we're, we're to, to today we're in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. So I invite you to turn uh, in your Bibles if you want to turn there, uh, or you can follow along on the screens as we go. Today we're going to actually go one verse at a time, because we're going to walk through this very powerfully packed, rich passage that we find here in these five verses. Uh, so again, we're, we're in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. And we've been, we've been in this place where John, the, 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 uh, the writer of the gospel, is, is introducing Jesus. He, he's telling us who Jesus is. Uh, it begins with the first several verses describing Jesus as the Word. And the Word was God. The Word was with God. And it describes who Jesus is. And, and, and the, 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 uh, the first part of this gospel really could be the answer to the question, who is Jesus? In your minds, who is Jesus? If you were to say, Jesus is, and there's a blank right, right after Jesus is. Jesus is who? And you might have many different names or many different ways to describe Jesus. But John is laying, he's building the case, he's building the, the introduction to who Jesus is. Jesus hasn't even entered the scene yet. He hasn't even said a word yet. And we're, we're almost through the, the, the first chapter of John. And so we're in this scene. If, if you remember last week, John the Baptist was introducing Jesus. He was preparing the people for the coming, the arrival of Christ onto the scene. He's preparing them by baptisms. Uh, he's preparing them by being the voice. Remember we, last week we talked about being the voice. And John the Baptist, as the Pharisees were interrogating and they're questioning, who are you? Who are you? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? Are you, are you the Messiah? And he said no to all those questions. He says, no, I'm merely a voice pointing you to who the Messiah really is. And so that's where we're at. That was day one. Today we're, we venture into day two. So it's the next day and John is continuing to introduce Jesus to the world. And by now Jesus is in their midst. Jesus is coming. Jesus is there on the scene. And so he's, he's there and let's begin with uh, verse 29 of our passage. We'll start with verse 29. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, we could spend two months on this verse alone. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist not only says who Jesus is in this moment, but he also says what Jesus does. Among many things, he takes away the sin of the world. Now, as John the Baptist describes Jesus as the Lamb of God, this is a very controversial saying. This, this perked their ears. When, when you would call someone a lamb, First of all, the lamb, the idea of a lamb in the Hebrew mind meant a lot. When you think of a lamb, what comes to your mind? Innocence, vulnerability, defenselessness, purity, sacrifice. When we hear the word lamb, we sing the lamb of God. The, the language of, of, of the lamb of God is, is all throughout our worship songs, our hymns, our worship songs. We sing the lamb of God. We, we talk about the lamb of God. When you hear the phrase lamb of God, what first comes to your mind? What first should come to our minds is the sacrifice. The sacrificial 
lamb. Now, John the Baptist was the son of a, of a Hebrew priest. He was the son of a, a Jewish priest. So John the Baptist knew very well what this whole sacrificial lamb thing was. He knew very well when you said lamb or sacrificial lamb, what that meant to the life of a Jew, what that meant to the mind of a Jew when they heard that. Because John the Baptist grew up in that environment. And the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, has a very significant meaning to those who heard this phrase. So when, when John the Baptist says he is the lamb of God, all kinds of images and thoughts flood into our Jew the Jewish minds at the time. See, it's very important when we read Scripture, especially when we read the New Testament, it's really important that we understand how they understood it, right? It's very important that, that we know the context. And so, so for the next few minutes, if you're okay with this, we're going we're gonna to talk about who Jesus is. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the riches of God's Word. Are you guys okay with that? We're going to challenge our minds a little bit, and we're going to dive deeper in to the theology of who Jesus is as the Lamb of God. Let's start with Leviticus. Let's go to the Old Testament, and let's go to Leviticus, and we're going to, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 4. Now, what is Leviticus about? Think about Leviticus. Leviticus is after Exodus. Let's think about the purpose of what Leviticus is. Many of us may not have ever read Leviticus. Maybe we don't know what Leviticus talks about. Maybe we don't know the purpose of Leviticus. Well, if you don't know, the book of Leviticus is basically a book that's, that's named after the tribe of Levi, the Levites, who, who are the priestly tribe. And it was basically God's instruction for the people of God to become the people of God through the worship and practices in the life of God. In other words, they had just been delivered out of, out of slavery from Egypt. They had been called out of the bondages of Egypt in a pagan land. And now God is setting them apart in the Sinai Peninsula, in the Sinai Desert, in this period of time called the 40 years that we know of. And he is now teaching them what it is like to be the people of God. And so he's giving them all these instructions and all of these ordinances and all of these rituals and all of these practices to be performed and carried out. And what these are, they're, they're, not, they're not righteousness in themselves, they're symbols, they're types and shadows of, of what represents the true life of God, the true worship of God, which would come later. So that's what Leviticus is about. And in the first four chapters of Leviticus, you have chapters one, two, three, and four. You, you, you start covering different types of offering. And then we come to chapter four, and we deal with the, the sin offering, the problem of sin, right? How many of you would agree that sin is a problem? Almost all of us, right? Not all of us, so that's a concern. But sin is an issue, right? Sin's a problem in our world. And sin, from the very day that it entered the world has wreaked havoc on creation, has it not? And so there's a section of Leviticus in chapter 4 called sin offerings. If you were to read that, specifically verses 27 to 31. Let's look at that on the screens if we could. Beginning with verse 27, God is giving the people of, uh, uh, the, the people of Israel a way to deal with the sin problem. In other words, sin offerings, and he's instructing them how they are going to be forgiven of sin, okay? So, if anyone of ordinary people among you sins unintentionally, I think that's interesting, that would, that would mean anybody who sins unintentionally, even if you sin, even if you, don't, if you don't realize it. How many of us have ever committed sin that at the time we did not even realize was sin, and later on we learned it was, right? It's, it's that, you know, this is a trite example, but, you know, you, you, you're, you're heading out of the grocery store and you look down and you realize that you just accidentally stole a gallon of milk. You forgot to pay for, right? It's all these little things, it's all of these, these unintentional, accidental 
discrepancies or violations of the laws of God. And they had a lot of them, right? And, and, and even those, even those had to be atoned for. Even those, all of sin had to be accounted for and reconciled. And so here's what he said they had to do. Anyone who ordinary people among you sins unintentionally in doing any of these, any of the things that you by the Lord's commandments ought not to be done and incurs guilt. So in other words, you incurred guilt from sin. Let's go, let's go to the next one. When the sin that you have committed is made known to you, you shall bring a female goat without blemish as your offering for the sin that you have committed. When you shall lay your hand on the head of the sin offering, that is the lamb, and the sin offering shall be slaughtered at the place of the burnt offering. Now what that really literally means is that they were commanded to take a spotless lamb, an innocent lamb, they were to place their head on the lamb, and they were to take a knife and slit its throat and kill it. And then they were to drain the blood and sprinkle it. Let's, let's keep going. The priest shall take some of its blood with the finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering, and he shall pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. This is gross. Let's keep going. He shall remove all its fat as the fat is removed from the offering of well-being and the priest shall turn it into smoke on the altar for a pleasing odor to the Lord. Thus the priest shall make atonement on your behalf and you shall be forgiven. So what does this mean? This means every time you sin, every time you violate God's law, you are to take Go and find a, a, a spotless lamb who, who had done nothing wrong. And that lamb had to pay the price with its life. And you had every time, you had to lay your hand on its head, slit its throat, drain its blood, and burn it on the offering. I know. Our kids are here with us on Family Sunday. Isn't this great? Isn't this a great thing to talk about on Family Sunday? That's horrible. How many animal lovers do we have here? This is hard for us to take, is it not? A lot of us here love animals. This is difficult for us to, to stomach, isn't it? Picturing that. And imagine living that way every day. Imagine every day you sin having to do that. If you read Exodus, which we won't read for the sake of time, if you go to Exodus chapter 29, it, 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 it describes the commandment that God gave the priest to do this every single day, morning and night for the people. They had to, to slaughter two lambs, two sacrificial lambs in the temple of worship, every morning, every night for the sin of the people, every day. What a horrible way to live. And if you're a priest, what, do, what a disgusting vocation, right? But this is what God commanded them to do. Why would God have them do this? Why would God, why would God want them to kill innocent creatures who had nothing to do with the sin, who had done nothing wrong, who did not deserve to die, to be killed and slaughtered because of someone else's sin? Why? Why? So that the people will remember that sin costs something. With every sin, there is a price to pay. Sin costs more than you think. And when we sin against God, the wages of sin is what? Death. Now there's the rest of that verse which is great news. But living in this life, the wages of sin, someone or something had to die as a result of sin. And the people who sinned didn't have to die. But something or someone had to die in its place. And so he did this, he had them do this every day, every sin, every time, as a way to remind them of the seriousness that sin is in the eyes and heart of God. Let me tell you something. We live in a culture in a time that dismisses and diminishes and devalues the power and destruction of sin. Do we not? 
We live in a culture that likes to explain away. We live in a culture that likes to d- discount the harm and the damage that sin can cause in someone's life. And we need to remember that sin costs everything to God. And this is why he had them do this. Now, this was not a sufficient sacrifice, as we see. I want us to, uh, to remember, as we look at this, we're talking about the atonement. We, when we talk about atonement, we're talking about the payment for sin. And, 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 and as I prepared this message, I thought about our kids being in here. And I thought about how this isn't necessarily easy for our kids to hear. But on the same token, it's also important for our kids to hear that sin cost something. Sin causes damage. Someone will be hurt because of sin, no matter what kind of sin. And so as we, as we deal with this idea of atonement and as we're understanding this idea of the Lamb of God, there's, there's different theories of atonement. When we talk about the Lamb of God, who Christ was, as he steps in to this Lamb of God role, what we need to be reminded of here today is that as God is reminding the people back then of the seriousness of sin and that sin cost someone or something's life, eventually it costs God his life. Amen? Eventually, sin costs Jesus Christ his life on the cross. And we deal with, the, we deal with this idea of atonement. And I think it's important to talk about atonement for just a moment. There's different theories of atonement. And this is where I want us to get our thinking caps on. I want you to... I, Resist the, 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 resist the urge to kind of drift away right now. Press in, lean in right now for this, for just a moment here. Let's talk about the different theories of atonement and in a way we understand Christ atoning for our sin as the Lamb of God. There's different theories, and I'm not going to name all of them, but I'll just name a few. The, one, the first one is the satisfaction theory. Now, many of us have been taught this. You've heard it. You've even read uh, in, uh, hints of it in scripture. It's, there's even verbiage that describes it in scripture. The satisfaction theory is this, that Jesus being the righteous lamb satisfies the wrath of God who demands sinlessness. And so there's this, this, uh, this theory that, that the, the, sac- the lamb of God who is Jesus Christ satisfies a bloodthirsty, angry God. Another theory that we, might, that we might have been taught is this, the theory of substitution, the substitution theory. The substitution theory is this, God's innocent son, the Lamb of God, is offered in sacrifice to take our place, okay? In other words, we should be on the cross, and Jesus Christ, therefore, substitute, as our substitute, takes our place instead of us. Now... That is more of a reformist theory that that is held. Another theory is the moral influence theory. The moral influence theory is the ultimate, that that, that the, the atonement is the ultimate expression of the death of God's love by sacrificing his son, which moves us to transformation and realizing how much God loves us. Now, these are different theories, and and the, and. There, there's an element of truth in every theory, although there's some we might distance ourselves from as Nazarenes. We might distance ourselves from more than others. But there's, there's, there's language in Scripture that, that these theories are based on. And the, the, the reason we call them theories is because there's no one complete way to describe the atonement. There isn't. In, in each theory, there's a limitation uh, and in each theory, there may be an element of truth, but there's different dimensions of the atonement that we, we can't fully define by human theories, okay? But I want us to look at this theory that's presented in the Gospel of John. And we see it in the language of, of, of chapter 1. But before we talk about that, 
the, these other theories I've mentioned, the problem with these other theories is that subconsciously they, they, they place God the Father and Jesus Christ as separate agents in the atonement, crucifixion. That's, that's the core problem with, with these other theories, is they take God the Father and, and we, we place him up, up in heaven in our minds and then we, and we separate Christ the Son on the cross as the helpless victim and we see God the Father and Christ the Son as two separate agents in the atonement. And there's a problem with that, with, with that, parts, those, that part of those theories. And the reason there's a problem is because we believe in what? The incarnation, right? We believe that Christ is the Word made flesh, right? We believe what, what John says in, in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? So, so we believe that Jesus Christ is God. We believe that Christ became man. In other words, God became man. We believe in the God-man, the incarnation. So we, we don't separate God from the crucifixion. What I love about the Gospel of John is it presents what's called the incarnational theory, and that is this. Think about this. When we hear the phrase, Lamb of God, this is beautiful, or at least it is to me. The death of Jesus on the cross is not Jesus separate from God. That is to say, the incarnation is at the heart of atonement. The, united, the, the uniting of the divine and the human in the man Jesus makes salvation possible. Follow me here. It is possible because divine life has fully entered human life, swallowing up the powers of sin and death, and now giving us the possibility to new life through the incarnation of Christ. For the Gospel of John, the Lamb who is sacrificed is not someone independent of God but is actually the Word made flesh who was slain. And I don't know about you, but that has a different feel to me. When I think of it as God himself dying, the Lamb of God himself becoming the sacrifice for my sin. And it is only be because of the incarnation, it's only because God became man that it is possible for that to happen. There is a beautiful picture in Genesis chapter 15. I won't read it for the sake of time because I know I'm, I'm getting too excited about all this anyway. But if you were to read Genesis chapter 15, go, go read Genesis chapter 15 and stop at verse 17. The, it's the picture where Abraham enters into the covenant with God, okay? Okay. Abraham and God enter into this covenant, and if you aren't familiar with the, the custom, they would take animals and they would literally cut them in half. Another gross illustration, sorry. But they would take the animals and they would cut them in half, and then the two parties entering into the covenant would literally walk through the middle of these animal pieces. Disgusting, right? They walk through the, the middle of the animal pieces saying that if I break this covenant, May what happens to these animals happen to me. Right? That's, that was the ancient custom. Well, in Genesis 15, Abraham enters into this covenant with God. God enters into the covenant with Abraham. But God does something very interesting. They, they cut the animals apart. They set them all aside. And, and, you know, assuming Abraham and God will walk through together. Not the case. God puts Abraham in a deep sleep. And what does God do? The presence of God who's represented in a fire pot, in a flame. He goes through it by himself. Without Abraham. God himself walks through the covenant he's made with man. And Abraham didn't do it. Why? Because Abraham couldn't. Abraham could not atone for his own sin. Only God himself was sufficient enough. And so you see in, Abraham, in Genesis 15, 17, God himself 
took that on. In other words, he says, if I break this covenant, may this happen to me. If you break this covenant, may this happen to me. Hence, the Lamb of God. Coming to do what? Take away the sin of the world. Do you see when, when, when John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, do you see what all the images that are flooding into their minds? Whew. If you were to read Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11, which I read at the beginning of our service as the call to worship, it, it echoes this, that, that Christ himself took on flesh and he himself humbled himself. He himself was the atonement. He humbled himself and went through and paid the price as the lamb of God. He takes away the sin of the world. Now, when we, we see that phrase, taking away the sin of the world, we need to understand what that means. It doesn't mean, it's not talking about every, every particular sin. What it's talking about is the sin of the world. In other words, the sin the damage and the effect of sin on the world. The sin of the cosmos, the, the sin of past, present, and future. The sin of the world. In other words, Christ, when he went to the cross and, and was the Lamb of God, the sufficient sacrifice in atonement for sin, he took away the sin of the world. Think about that. Because he's the only one that could. He took away the sin of the world in past, present, and future. And in verse 30, John the Baptist describes this. In verse 30, if, you, if we go there, this is whom he said, after me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. And what John is doing is he's, he's describing the eternal nature of Jesus Christ. There are seven sayings in the book of John, the I am sayings. John understands Jesus Christ as an eternal person. Before, present, and future. Verse 31, I myself did not know him as he talks about who John, John understood Jesus. He says, I, I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. John is saying, he, he was his cousin, okay? It wasn't, he's, not, he's not saying I didn't know him in, in relationship. What he's saying is I didn't know who he was until now. And I now see by the testimony of the Holy Spirit descending upon him, that he is who I'm saying he is. Verse 32, as we kind of draw our time to a close here, I want us to read verse 32. And it's very important that we see this. In verse 32, John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Now, what he's describing here is the moment of Jesus' baptism. We don't see it described in John. We see it described in the other Gospels. But this has apparently already happened. And John is de describing this, the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. But what I don't want us to miss here is this. The second part of that verse says, descending on him like a dove, and it remained on him. Now, what that means is, the Holy Spirit came on Jesus and never left him. Now, if you go to the Old Testament, you can see the figures in the Old Testament. Samuel, Saul, uh, Samson, for instance, right? The Holy Spirit, it was described as the Holy Spirit came upon them and then the power of the Holy Spirit was on them, but the Holy Spirit left them. In Christ, when the Holy Spirit came, it rested upon him. Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 says, A shoot shall come out from Jesse... That is the line of David. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. That, that is a prophecy that connects what John is saying. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Now, as we go to the, the second to last verse here, and I promise we're, we're turning the corner here. Let's look at verse 33. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize you with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. We're, we're, we're talking today about who Jesus is and more specifically what Jesus does. And as John describes this, this is the part that describes what Jesus does. Now, many of us, most of us I hope, 
have been baptized with water. People here, John the Baptist was baptizing them with water. Now, what the water baptism represents is a, it's a symbol of repentance. It's a profession of faith. It's saying, I was living this way, and now I realize I need to turn my heart to God and follow him, and so I am being baptized, and I'm, I'm becoming a new person in Christ. That's what baptism does, right? And, and it's a symbol. It's an outward sign of an inward grace. It's a profession of faith in Jesus. It's a starting point, okay? That's what baptism is. And baptism by water is done by men. But baptism of the Holy Spirit is only done by Jesus Christ. And many of us may not understand what that means. And I just want to, as I close, I just want to describe this real quick. Here's the picture. It helps us to understand when we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, only Jesus Christ does that. No man can baptize you by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Not me, not any pastor, not any clergy of any kind can baptize you with the Holy Spirit. To understand what it means to be baptized by the Holy Spirit, we see this as what's called a second work of grace. Baptism by water is a symbol or it's significant to the salvation of our, of our person in Jesus Christ. That's the starting point. That's the first work of grace. But, and at that time, we are given the Holy Spirit. We are. We are given the Holy Spirit who lives within us and we are then growing in Christ. Okay, you follow me? Now John's talking about, John the Baptist is talking about baptism with the Holy Spirit that Jesus does. What does that mean? Well, it's important to understand what it means to the Hebrew mind with the word baptism. Literally, when you say baptize, you, you take something and they would often quote baptize garments and dye. In other words, if a, if a white garment, if they wanted to make it a color, they would dip it or submerge that garment into the dye. And so as that garment comes out of the dye, it is no longer a white garment, it is a purple garment, or a red garment, or a blue garment, okay? So what it does is it's submerging something underneath being swallowed up and saturated with this, this substance, this form, and coming out, it is a, it is a new thing. And so when we talk about being baptized with the Holy Spirit, another phrase we could use is entire sanctification. It's a very churchy long word. But what this means is that Jesus Christ, as we grow in, in, in faith, saturates us with the Holy Spirit. To the point where you, you are submerged in the Holy Spirit and your life oozes with the presence and the Spirit of God. And you, your life and your whole person is saturated as a new being sanctified by Christ. That is powerful. That is the second work of grace. That is the continual work of grace. And that doesn't necessarily happen in one instant. It happens continually in a process. But as we are saturated as our lives are submerged in the Holy Spirit, that is a work of none other than Jesus Christ. And it requires surrender and it requires submission. As we close, we see these words by John the Baptist in verse 34, says this, and I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now, I know that I've gone through a lot of stuff this morning. Your brains are probably hurting a little bit. But I'm telling you, it is important that we lay the foundation and that we explore the riches of who Jesus is as we begin to explore this gospel that tells his story. Jesus hadn't even spoken a word yet. But may we understand the fullness of who he is even before he begins to minister to us in his story through the Gospel of John. I want to invite our worship team to come forward and we're going to close this morning with the remembrance and thought in mind the picture of Christ Christ
as the Lamb of God. That has taken away the sin of the world. Let me tell you something. We have new life. We have been forgiven. We have entered into this life of grace and love that can only be experienced in God through Jesus Christ. And it was only made possible because he became the Lamb of God. We're going to receive communion this morning. And we always say, you do not have to be a member of our church to receive communion. We only ask that as you receive communion this morning, that you profess your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. You'll be invited to come in just a few moments as Pastor Brandon prepares to lead us. But I want to share this passage of scripture as we turn our hearts to the Lord's table. I invite you to stand. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. Do we know who we're talking about yet? And as one from whom others hid their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities, he has carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that was made, that has made us whole. And by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. And yet did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So did he not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and in his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offering and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. That's baptism by the Holy Spirit, by the way. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. Father, we come to you today. We praise you and we thank you that you became the Lamb of God. And because you did, we now know life. We now have hope. We now have a future in you. So lead us and guide us and continue to baptize us in your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name.